palaces, the most spectacular and lavish homes on earth. Luxuriously designed for the royals who wanted the biggest and the best. Behind the golden gates of these royal megastructures are incredible stories waiting to be discovered. Infamous monarchs from history and the artists, designers and engineers who turned their grand visions into a reality. These are the most opulent, flamboyant and innovative royal residences around the world. This time, the home of one of the world's most powerful royal dynasties, the Habsburgs. At their peak, the imperial family's branches spread across Central Europe, and for 350 years, Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, Austria, was their main summer residence. Its 1,441 rooms have played host to some of Europe's most influential figures and events, making Schönbrunn one of the world's greatest palaces. Marie Antoinette, Mozart, and Napoleon Bonaparte, just a few of the famous names who have walked the corridors of this breathtaking building. Starting life as a hunting lodge, after a major renovation, Schönbrunn Palace became the home of the Habsburg monarchy between 1569 and 1918. Bobby Titmarsh moved from the UK to Vienna over three decades ago and has never looked back. Schönbrunn is, for me, is my life. Uh, I started to work in Schönbrunn in 1974, basically as a guide. So I've seen the paintings from the front, from the back, from the side. I know where the cobwebs are. I know Schönbrunn inside out. And it's become my, my home to a certain extent. It's just become part of my life. And for me, definitely something special. Schönbrunn holds many engineering secrets. In 1744, architect Nikolaus Bukassi turned the former hunting lodge into a palace fit for royalty by designing a clever way of keeping the servants separate from the imperial family. In this room, you can see one of the largest stoves in Schönbrunn. All of the stoves were stoked from the other side. To stoke the stoves, the servants would have had to go through that door, or through doors like this, into the corridor to get to the back of the stove. And those corridors were used by the servants so that they could do their work, but they were also used by members of the imperial family so that they could bypass the rooms. So if the emperor was standing in one of these rooms, you wouldn't be able to walk through the room. Even if you were the crown prince, you would have to bypass the room by using the doors on the left-hand side. I like to compare the system that we've got to that in England. In the stately homes in England, you have a system of upstairs and downstairs. So the family lived in the rooms on the first floor or second floor, whereas the servants were in the basement below. In Schönbrunn, we've got the same system, but we've got inside and outside. All of the rooms that were used by the imperial family have got their windows on the outside of the building, whereas the rooms and the corridors on the inside of the building have got their windows on the inner courtyards. So all of the work was done on the other side of these walls, and the family was completely undisturbed. Bobby knows all about Schönbrunn's long history. The palace itself dates way back into the 16th century. It used to be a hunting lodge, and it wasn't called Schönbrunn originally. It was called the Katterburg. And there is a legend connected with that building. The Emperor Matthias, he reigned during the 16th century, is said to have gone hunting in the Vienna woods, and he found a small natural spring and tasted the water of the spring and said in German, 
Mai, das ist aber ein schönes Wasser, ein schöner Brunnen, a beautiful spring. And that spring gave this palace that was later built its name. The imperial family who ruled over Austria at the time were the Habsburgs. Their lineage goes back to the 11th century. The Habsburgs are one of the oldest royal families in Europe. They're incredibly powerful, incredibly wealthy. At one point, really, they were seen as the greatest royal family in Europe. So what the Habsburgs wanted, the Habsburgs got. They start off in Switzerland as Counts of Habsburg in 1020. And by 1276, they're ruling Austria. and They're very powerful. They always used to say, the House of Austria never declares war. It always marries heiresses. This is part of a process that we call dynasticism, whereby the power and the marriage um, network was very important. And they were, as a dynasty, obviously vastly influential. The original hunting lodge was destroyed by Turkish invaders during their unsuccessful siege of Vienna in 1683. Ten years later, an unknown Austrian architect named Johann Bernard Fischer von Erlach was asked to rebuild Schönbrunn, but little is known of his final design. We don't know very much about this palace. It was unfortunately not finished. I mean, it was finished in the constructive part. It was built, it had a flat roof because this was the Italian style, but not proper for our climate. It was just a hunting lodge, but in the dimensions, which is now the dimensions of the Schönbrunn Palace. Schönbrunn would remain incomplete until Emperor Charles VI gifted it as a wedding present to his daughter, the future Empress Maria Theresa. When Charles VI died, she came very often here. She had already the family with her children. And then she decided in uh, 1744 to remodel and to reconstruct the palace towards a really summer residence with all the needs, with all the ceremonial needs and the purpose to stay here with her family. And so this was the time when when Schönbrunn Palace became this, what it is nowadays, with all the buildings beside, to host all the functions and the offices of the court. It had to host something like 1,000 to 1,500 people here. So she needed a big place to cover all the needs. Maria Theresia's feeling towards Schönbrunn developed when she was a child. This was still a hunting lodge and the imperial family would have come to this building to go hunting in the Vienna woods. And she would have spent her childhood years in Schumbrunn. But she was fond of the building. If it wasn't for Maria Theresia, Schumbrunn would never have become what it is today. To make her vision a reality, Empress Maria Theresa turned to Italian-Austrian architect, Nicolaus Pucassi. He's so incredibly important in Schönbrunn's history because he largely gave us the Schönbrunn Palace that we know today. It was such a huge project and the process of renovation meant the palace itself had to be extended, indeed enlarged, and um, he was largely responsible for this. The only record that we have is that Maria Theresia mentioned in a letter to somebody, I don't remember, that Bacassi is an architect who understands her ideas and he knows to realize it. We can figure out that he was learning by doing. When he dismantled the inside in the middle, the ground floor, it must have been a big risk that not everything is falling down because he took all the walls out to make a passage from the courtyard to the garden. So it was quite risky what he did. The original building only had two floors. As you can see, this building has got three floors. And Maria Theresia had everything changed. 
The height of the rooms on the main floor was approximately eight meters. By reducing this to five meters, Pakassi was able to insert an entire floor to Shundrun without modifying the external structure of the building. And the central part of the palace has not got those rooms, and that's where the ballroom is, and the ballroom is the original height. Architect Pakassi's plans for Shumbrun included 1,441 rooms in the 175-meter-wide symmetrical palace. He was influenced by a new style that was sweeping Europe in the middle of the 18th century. The palace interiors are mainly in the Rococo style. It's the style which was developed in the Maria Theresian epoch. It's the style of her period. And you can see it all over in the rooms. This is very typical for the period for Rococo. Light, lively, and asymmetrical. It's nearly the opposite to Baroque. Baroque is always very heavy, symmetrical and dark. All of the designs that you can see are asymmetrical. Whereas if this was a Baroque room, you would be able to slice everything into two halves and it would fit together. That can't be done here. It does actually look quite tasteful to us now in our age of kitsch. It looks very beautiful. But then it was really uh, excess. It was really a big statement with its sort of extra ornamentation, extra decoration. It was just perfect for a palace because everything about it said, I am the greatest, I am the emperor, and bow down in front of me. So it was really a high expression of huge amounts of money. It was meant to awe the eye. Maria Theresa was also a formidable woman on the political scene. During her 40-year reign as empress, she made many reforms across the Austrian Empire, providing education for the lower classes and modernizing the judicial system. Maria Theresa was really Europe's mother-in-law, but she had 16 children and 56 grandchildren, not all of which survived. And so she really was at the pinnacle of a huge network of family that was underpinned by political marriages. Maria Theresa was an incredibly powerful matriarch. In the time of great matriarchs, she was the most powerful. She was intelligent, she was determined, she was an incredible political power player. She was an absolutely indomitable woman, you would never, ever want to say no to her. She was, I think, the greatest empress. She was an extremely strong woman that would not give way. She was of the opinion that God gave her the rights that she had, and only God can take those rights away from her. These are the lands that she was entitled to, and she defended those lands with everything that she had. She tried to make new alliances with other countries in Europe. Maria Theresa wants to extend her power through Europe, through her children, and she was incredibly effective at marrying her children into the greatest royal families of Europe. It was all the Habsburg spin, the Habsburg propaganda. The one we remember most of her children is Marie Antoinette, who married into the French royal family. And we always see her as this great French princess. But when she was hated during the French Revolution, they called her the Austrian, the Austrian princess. They're obsessed with her being a foreigner. And Marie Antoinette, that was an amazing coup for her. She had married in to the French royal family. She was a future queen of France. Marie Antoinette has gone down in history as the epitome of French aristocracy during the country's bloody revolution of 1789. But she began her life at Schönbrunn as a little girl named Maria Antonia. Over here you can see Maria Theresa's second youngest child. Her name was Maria Antonia, better known as Marie Antoinette. She married the King of France, Louis XVI, and was beheaded on the guillotine in 1793 during the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette remained stoic up until the very end, 
The strength of her mother, Empress Maria Theresa, seemed to be imparted in all 11 of her daughters. All of the daughters of Maria Theresa, except Marie Christine, they almost haven't seen their husbands before the marriage. They just had paintings, portraits of them to have an idea what the future husband is looking like. There is a sentence documented of Marie Caroline, who was married with the King of Naples. And when she met him, she wrote in a letter, I was surprised he was less ugly as I supposed, but more stupid than he should be. One of Empress Maria Theresa and her husband, Francis Stephen of Lorraine's additions to the grounds of the palace is now one of Vienna's most popular attractions, with over two million visitors per year. Gerhard Heindl has worked at Schönbrunn Zoo for over 20 years. So we are now in the heart of Schönbrunn Zoo, in the central pavilion. Uh, it's part of the Baroque architecture we have in this zoo, dating back to uh, 1752, including some of the old animal houses in the administration building. Uh, but this is the very heart of Schönbrunn Zoo. This is the place where the emperors have been to watch the animals and where they celebrated some family affairs. The zoo was the brainchild of Francis Stephen, who wanted it to be a symbol of the Habsburg power and wealth. It was state of the art in the first half and until the, the second half of the 18th century, uh, it was a must have was a representative thing. The Habsburgans were one of the ruling dynasties of Europe, and they had to have something. We don't know really what kind of animals were there, but in literature it's transported that it were mostly water birds or other birds. We think that Franz Stephen and his wife also must have had uh, monkeys and parrots and something like this. Then we know about sheep and goats, exotic ones, also deer and also a reindeer. And it wasn't just animals that Maria Theresa and Francis Stephen were interested in. The gardens at Schönbrunn were full of exotic plants and trees from around the world. When it came to building a winter home for the rare flora, the Empress once again turned to architect Nikolaus Bacassi. The result was the impressive orangery, which is now managed by Peter Hozek. The orangery was finished around 1756 because the Empress Maria Theresia uh, that want, wanted to have a, a storage for these wonderful plants that they collected all over the world within the years, and, and they wanted to have a storage area and they also wanted to have a heatable storage area because the plants would otherwise die when they stay outside of the winter. So they built this, uh, this wonderful building, uh, which is one of the longest, actually I think this is the longest uh, orangery with a 189 meter length. It's a fantastic uh, architectural building. The huge orangery uses an ancient central heating design known as Hippocaust. It's a system that dates back to 350 BC. It works by burning wood in a furnace under the floor and then allowing the hot air to rise through hollow bricks in the walls. This ensures the temperature inside the orangery is perfect for plants during the harsh Vienna winters. First of all, of course, this wonderful heating system that I'm sitting on right now, uh, which is the, the Hippocaust uh, heating system, which you know from the Romans. And this system is installed here back then and still operating and still working and still in use these days. As you can see, it's quite cold in here. So uh, when it freezes outside, they put all the woods that they collect in the park still up to this day and they put it in this heating system to heat up the whole room. And in the winter time, it can have up to 14, 15 degrees Celsius here. It's fresh, it's crisp, it's a lot of oxygen, little uh, humidity, and it's, it's just nice. The Orangery now hosts daily classical concerts, 
where the Schönbrunn Palace Orchestra perform the music of one of Austria's most famous sons, composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. The child protege first performed here in 1762 and will always be linked with the palace. Mozart's father, Leopold Mozart, was very conscious of his son. He was very knowledgeable of music at the, at the young age of five or six years. And Leopold then took his son to different cities in Europe and introduced his son to members of the royal families. And one of those families was the imperial family in Vienna, Maria Theresia and her husband, Francis Stephen of Lorraine. And a concert took place in the so-called Mirror Room in Schumbrunn in 1762. He was playing the harpsichord for the Empress and uh, his father, Leopold, presented him as the Wunderkind. Young Mozart was a hit with the imperial family. They took the place by storm. Maria Theresa clapped and clapped. She picked him up and put him on her knee, whereupon he reached up, put his arms around her neck and gave her a big kiss. This is the story. Uh, we don't really know if it's true, but it's a cute little story, and, uh, and I think we should keep this, this kind of story, because I'm sure that a five-year-old kid would do something like that. Stories of Mozart's first performance at the palace have become folklore. Mozart is said to have tripped over as he went into the room, and he fell to the floor. And the imperial family were sitting on the other side of the room, watching, waiting for the musicians to start. And little Marie Antoinette, she was only about two years older than Mozart, she ran over and then picked him up, which is something that's a no-go. That's something that members of the imperial family would never do, should never do. But that young, say, eight-year-old Marie Antoinette helped Mozart to his feet. And this little boy then turned around and said, you're so sweet. When I get older, I'd like to marry you. And I think that would have been better for both of them. It's an amazing moment of history when you think that Mozart would have met Marie Antoinette there. What must they have thought of each other? And obviously, she would just be a face in the crowd to him. But two of them to go on to have these great, incredible lives. Arguably, we might say, two of the most famous people of 18th century Europe were there together in the same room, listening to Mozart play and be such a musical genius. 240 years after Mozart first played at the palace, another famous face performed in the Orangery. In 2001, former US President Bill Clinton was attending a gala event at Schönbrunn. So it was a dinner, and after the dinner, uh, there was a jazz band playing. One guy from the American company came to me and said, can Mr. President play? And I personally picked the saxophone and put it in the corner. It was ready. And then I went to him and said, Mr. President, would you like to play with the band? And he looked at me and he couldn't believe it and said, well, do you have a saxophone? He said, sure. But was the 42nd president of the United States in the same musical league as Mozart? He was fantastic. He did a really, really good job. He played for like 45 minutes. So for us, it was a big thing because we made pictures and it was in the newspaper everywhere. Hosting political dignitaries at Schönbrunn was also essential for the Habsburgs in the 18th century. During Maria Theresa's reign, Austria's allegiance with France held great importance. The two countries allied during the Seven Years' War which was being fought across Europe between 1756 and 1763. Victory for Austria over Prussia at the Battle of Kolin in 1757 led to the building of one of Schönbrunn's most beautiful structures, the Gloriette. The impressive monument was designed by local architect Johann Ferdinand Hetzendorf von Hohenberg in 1772 stood atop a 60-meter-high hill. The imposing Gloriette took three years to build and is considered the first classical-style building in Austria. We're at the top of the hill, so this used to be a part of the Vienna Woods, 
But when the Gloriette was built, uh, the top of the hill was flattened, and they started to build the Gloriette, and it was finished in 1775. But it was built to commemorate Austria's victory at the Battle of Colin, so a type of an Arc de Triomphe. Part of the Gloriette was destroyed by the Allied forces during the Second World War and restored soon after in 1947. There were two air raids, one in October 1944, and the second air raid was in February 1945. And in February 1945, they were trying to hit the military installation that was built in 1938 by the German Third Reich. Some of the bombs fell short of their target, or most of the bombs fell short of their target, and 270 bombs landed in the grounds of Schumbrunn. One bomb hit the main building, and one bomb hit the left-hand side of the Gloriette and completely destroyed one-third of the Gloriette. So if you're talking about the left-hand side of this building, that's new. If you're talking about the right-hand side, then these are the old decorations. Just five years after the Gloriette was originally finished in 1775, so was Maria Theresa's reign at Schönbrunn. She died in 1780. She was only 63 years of age, but after uh, contracting smallpox in 1762, uh, she deteriorated. She became very big. She couldn't move. She needed to be carried back and forth in a sedan chair. They even lifted her from one floor to the other. Uh, she couldn't climb stairs. But she would have seen this building for the last five years of her life, definitely. She was proud. She'd made an achievement. She'd created a majestic complex that showed what power she had and how mighty she was. Schumbrunn symbolizes the might of the Habsburg Empire. By 1793, relations between France and Austria had soured. Napoleon Bonaparte seized power in 1799 after the fallout from the French Revolution and was intent on conquering Europe. The Napoleonic Wars were a problem for Austria and a problem for Schumbrunn as time went on. The Austrians won a major battle near Vienna, the Battle of Aspern, but they lost a major battle shortly afterwards, the so-called Battle of Wagram and that led to Vienna being occupied by the French. And the Austrian emperor was obliged to let Napoleon use half of the palace as his residence, so to speak. So Maria Theresia's rooms, the 18th century rooms at the back of the palace, virtually the best rooms that we've got, were used by Napoleon. The emperor, Francis I of Austria, had a cunning strategy to broker a peace deal with the diminutive general. He married off his daughter to Napoleon. Napoleon's second wife was Maria Luisa, which brought him a little bit of help from his son-in-law, virtually. Uh, his son-in-law wouldn't harm him as much as what he would have done had he not given his daughter in marriage to the French emperor. In the Habsburg family, there was already this tradition to make compromises, to make marriages that brings you together, maybe with your, even if you are enemies. I mean, this is a tradition that Maria Theresia followed and her predecessors followed. So marrying was just always a political strategy of the Habsburg monarch. This was Napoleon's study. This is where Napoleon worked in 1805 and again in 1809. The people that came to see the French emperor came into that room where they would have been able to speak to the emperor. But if the emperor wanted them to go to his study, they would have been here in this room. This is, for instance, where the Treaty of Schumbrunn was signed in 1809. After the signing of the treaty, where France imposed harsh diplomatic sanctions on Vienna, Napoleon was conducting drills in the grounds of the palace. Watching on was a disgruntled civilian with murder on his mind. 
Friedrich Stabs was a German and he did not like the idea of being occupied by France. And he thought the best way to get rid of the threat to Germany would be to kill the emperor. So he was standing in the courtyard of Schumbrunn with a roll of paper. And in the roll of paper, he hid a dagger and then marched towards the emperor and saying, your majesty, your majesty, I'd like to show you my petition. And then the officers stopped him shortly before he got close to the emperor and found the dagger. He was brought to the study where Napoleon was in Inchenbrunn. And Napoleon is said to have asked Friedrich Stabs, if I forgive you for what you've done, what would you do? And Friedrich Stabs said, if I have the chance, then I'd kill you. And that was definitely the end. He was taken and then the firing squad did everything else. It was an act of defiance that could have changed the course of history across Europe. Schumbrunn is the site of a great what if in history. And the what if is, what if Napoleon died? The great Napoleon would have been executed and everything we know about French history, about Napoleon's war with the entirety of Europe would have been changed. By 1848, Napoleon had been defeated and Austria had a new emperor, Franz Joseph I. He chose Schönbrunn as his favorite residence and shared the palace with his wife, Empress Elizabeth of Austria, known affectionately as Sisi. Often compared to Princess Diana, Sisi became a popular figure across Austria and Hungary. Olivia Lickscheidel is the curator of a museum at Vienna's Hofburg Palace, dedicated to the former empress. Sissi was very special. I think she was so different in her time. She was emancipated, she was strong, she was shy. She was um, lovely, but she criticized a lot. So maybe it's this difference in her character between an easy person and a difficult person that makes her so, so interesting. Sisi was just a teenager when she arrived at Schönbrunn. Sisi was a little princess of Bavaria, but she was the cousin of the Emperor of Austria, Franz Joseph. And when he fell in love with her, so she got the chance to have this love match. And she came here when she was only 15. As a bride, she had to come before to Schönbrunn Palace. So she arrived here and everything was strange. She didn't know where to go, what to do. This was very, very difficult for her. When she did marry Franz Josef, she wrote only two weeks after the wedding in a poem that's very poignant, freedom thou hast turned from me. And she um, felt as if she'd become completely bound by the position. But as her mother, Ludovica, said, one does not send the Emperor of Austria packing. So she really didn't have much choice. And I think the fact that she made this um, incredible marriage to what really was the most eligible royal bachelor of the 19th century surprised her more than it did anyone else. One of the lasting legacies from Franz Joseph and Sisi's time at Schönbrunn is the magnificent Palm House the home to the Imperial Botanical Collection. Daniel Rohauer has been the head gardener at Schönbrunn for 15 years. The plans to build the palm house were started around 1860, when the old greenhouses were rotten down so heavily that they needed to be rebuilt. And then it took quite long to make the Caesar Franz Josef invest the money. We know about 15 sketches, different ways how to design the palm house. And all 15 were presented to the Caesar, and the Caesar said, no, I don't like this. I want it a bit different. Franz Joseph finally decided that if he was going to build a palm house, it would be the biggest and the best. In 1855, the Bessemer process had revolutionized steel production. It was now cheaper and available in larger quantities. Architect Franz Sagenschmidt 
chose to use steel instead of iron when designing the state-of-the-art structure. He's a Viennese local. He also worked then on and cooperated a lot with railways. He made many railway bridges, and he knew how to work with this new material, with steel, because not many people were skilled in this. He did his job very properly, and the very special architectural way he found, and this is also why our palm house, first it was built 50 years later than the Kew Garden palm house, uh, looks a bit lighter, is that all the carrying massive iron construction is put outside. So it is like a frame around and the glass construction is hung into it. The work on the palm house took two years and uh, 30 million gulden were invested. This was quite a lot of money for this time, but still less than the architect thought that it would cost. The 113 meter long and 28 meter high palm house took two years to build and opened in 1882. 100 years later, modern day engineering attempts to improve Sagan Schmidt's design were unsuccessful. In the original building, there were airing openings in the wall. And in the 1980s, they were closed because they said like cold air from outside comes in. But now we know that it was an airing for the glasses, that there is not so much condensed water that is dropping down. And a few years ago, there was a special airing system installed. This has a special filter, and in the original building, it was just an opening slit in the wall where the air thrives through and up the glass and did it. And in the 80s, really, really thought that they, they know everything and, and did quite some mistakes. The emperor behind the palm house, Franz Joseph, and his wife, Cece, had four children together, three daughters and one son. The heir to the throne, Rudolf, born in 1858. The crown prince, Rudolf, was a person with a lot of fantasy. He was a liberal thinking person. And for the court in Vienna, he was, as we call, a persona non grata. So nobody wanted him to influence politics. Then his wedding was not very happy with Stephanie from Belgium. He had a daughter with her, but it was not the big love. So he used drugs, he had lots of mistresses, and all that led to a terrible tragedy, what we call the tragedy of Meierling, uh, where he committed suicide and killed the, the young mistress, Marie Vetcherer. So that was something terrible for the Catholic court here, you have to imagine that. The murder committed by Rudolf and his subsequent suicide on the same fateful night, the 30th of January, 1889, was devastating for Sisi and Franz Joseph. Sisi was very strong in that time, and she was the first one who got the information. And she was the one that gave the terrible news to Franz Joseph. And she was the one that supported Franz Joseph in the first days, weeks. And the moment he started to work again and to have his normal life, she started to travel. That was her way to come over this terrible tragedy. She started to travel a lot after Rudolf's death because she said, when I'm away, then I'm on one side alone and on the other side, I can go where I want to go and I can meet only the people I want to meet and I can think about lots of things. Her travels took the 60-year-old Cece and her lady-in-waiting to Switzerland in 1898. She would never return to Schönbrunn again. Cece was in Geneva and she had no bodyguards in that moment because she often refused to have them, thinking that she was not important. She's not doing politics, she's a woman, defenseless, nothing will happen. But in Geneva, there was Luigi Lucchini, a young Italian, who had a terrible life before. He suffered because he was poor and he wanted to make a sign against rich people. He observed both women because she and her court lady were dressed in black and he didn't know who is now Sissy the left one, the right one. So he looked at them, he watched them, 
and when he knew who Sissi was, then he ran to her with a file and he really made it with a strong uh, push in her heart. And then they brought her back to the hotel, Hotel Bourrivage, where she died. So it's a very tragic end. I think it almost broke poor old emperor. A son committing suicide and a wife stabbed to death. The Austro-Hungarian Empire mourned for their beloved Sisi. Thousands turned out to see her funeral cortege on the 17th of September, 1898. People compare her to Diana because of the problems she had on court, because of all the critics here. Diana died very young, very young in the accident. Sisi was assassinated. And in the end, this is what made her really be a myth today. Nobody knew her when she was older. But in the end, the, the last moment to make really a myth out of Sisi was her assassination. It was the death of Sisi's son, Crown Prince Rudolf, that set off a chain of events that would eventually put an end to the Austrian imperial family. Emperor Franz Joseph had lost his direct successor. His brother, Karl Ludwig, died, and his nephew, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was killed in Sarajevo, which signaled the beginning of the First World War. When Franz Joseph died on the 21st of November, 1916, his great nephew, Karl I, and wife Zita, became the last emperor and empress to live at Schönbrunn Palace. Karl relinquished participation in the administration of the state on Armistice Day, the 11th of November, 1918. You can't talk about an end of a dynasty with Karl. You can talk about um, the end of the monarchy here because Karl and Tita had to leave Vienna then because they were asked to participate in the parliament as politicians, but they, they said, no, that's impossible. So they officially never abdicated. Therefore, they had to leave Austria. And Karl died in Madeira. 100 years after the death of the final Habsburg emperor, the palace lives on as a museum which has been open to the public since the 1960s. Even in the modern world, the scale and the might of Schönbrunn and its 500-acre grounds continue to amaze people from around the globe. Schönbrunn is definitely one of the most beautiful palaces in Europe, in my opinion. You've got millions of visitors that go through the rooms, and it's getting more and more and more as the years go by. Schönbrunn is one of the best preserved Habsburg palaces and preserved in the way that you can still feel the time of Maria Theresa. It's very authentic. That's what people say when they come to Schönbrunn Palace, that they have the feeling that the empress left it only some days ago. So we try to make it very familiar. We often forget how powerful and important the Habsburgs were. And when you go to Schumbrunn, you see how they were so powerful, so feared, and no one ever thought that their great reign, their great power would ever end. And so Schumbrunn, to me, is both an amazing representation of the Habsburgs and their great power, and also a reminder that power never lasts.